this work could be considered, if I were to give it another title, uh, something like Sects and the Cities, in which we've got SETS located in their urban environment. I'm really interested in the way in which ancient religious communities, in particular communities that had extreme beliefs and that demanded of their members allegiance only to the group and to, to no other, um, to their urban environment. How did these groups that had extreme theologies that predicted that the end of the world would come soon, or simply that their grasp on the way that the world works and the way that the gods, or in the case of Judaism, God requires people to behave is only properly understood by their group and by no others. So the relationship of sects to the urban environment um, is what this book is about. In some ways, it's a study in ethics. I'm, I'm very much interested here in exploring the obligations that various ancient communities imposed upon insiders, those who belonged to sects and some highly exclusive or exclusionary philosophical schools, um, and also the obligations that they imposed upon um, members' behavior toward outsiders, from their, their fellow citizens who weren't members of the sect to the governing authorities, both local authorities who shared their ethnicity and imperial authorities, either the Hellenistic kings or the Roman imperial um, rulers. I came to the study of apocalyptic sects through what is sort of analogous to immersive learning in a language. I was tossed, or rather born, into an apocalyptic sectarian environment. My parents began their sectarian journey um, as radical hippies who sought to live a pure life wholly in accordance with nature. They left society to go beyond the power lines, off the grid, out into the natural world where they could experience life in its unadulterated form. This, of course, required them to make claims about the truth. They had the truth. Others were absolutely deluded. Society was corrupt and something to escape. And so, like other sectarians, they cut themselves off from economy, from taxes, from laws. Many of my parents' stories from that era involve things like some harmless, like waking up with rattlesnakes in the sleeping bag. Others a little more dangerous, like harvesting the marijuana crop early because the Forest Service was on the way. What happened in the mountains in Northern California, Humboldt County, which uh, is rather famous for this kind of thing, a mountain man named Gilman Welch, sort of a prophetic figure in a way, met my parents and began schooling them in the rudiments of survival in the mountains. He also taught them about Jesus. He was a retired Wesleyan minister and gave them Bibles, gave them oranges, chopped their firewood. Eventually, by the time I was about six months old, my parents were ready to exchange one form of ecstatic sectarian experience and truth the Beatles and marijuana and so on, for another that was Jesus and the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and healing with hands laid on, anointed with oil. This was the environment that I remember because that was what I grew up in since the age of six months. My father was a Pentecostal preacher. My mother was also ordained as um, a, a minister in the Assemblies of God. As I grew up, we fully knew that we alone had the truth. We alone understood how scripture ought to be read. We alone understood that scripture talk 
about our times. Our times, as reported on the nightly news, in the newspapers, was simply another version of the Bible. A really famous and common uh, saying among the, these circles was that it was difficult in the morning to discern or to, to distinguish before one had coffee between what was on the coffee table. You pick up a book and you don't know if you're reading the daily newspaper or the Bible because they say they're talking about exactly the same things. The last day's newsletter was a publication that interpreted biblical prophecy in terms of the events that were happening in our time. We knew that Jesus' return was right around the corner. We knew that we were the only group of Christians that had the truth, and we lived in preparation for the end of days. Now I'm a scholar of ancient apocalyptic sectarians who believed with just as much conviction as my parents and myself up until the end of high school that the end of days was right around the corner. All of the historical events that occurred during the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls sect, the Covenanters, um, as, as I'll explain in a moment, the events of their time were predicted by the prophets, by Habakkuk, by Nahum, by Isaiah, by David, who's regarded as a prophet, um, and his psalms are read as such. The sectarians had a worldview and an experience that seemed very similar to me to that which, with which I grew up. Their methods of interpreting current events as fulfillments of uh, scriptural prophecy seemed quite, uh, quite like what my own family um, taught and what my father and my mother preached from the pulpit. Um, and I was fascinated with understanding the origins of this kind of thinking, both within early Judaism and also with, within early Christianity. My journey to professorial study of ancient apocalyptic Jewish sects within the Hellenistic and Roman context um, came about in, you know, with a few twists and turns. Once I left the Assemblies of God and the radical apocalyptic sectarian churches that we belong to, I had little interest in returning in any way. I thought perhaps I'd be a forest ranger and help save the planet because I thought this was worth saving. Um, the earth matters. It's not only heaven. Along the way, I became fascinated with languages, and the study of languages convinced me that I needed to, I needed to master the earliest ones first so that I could get a handle on the ones that came after them. I decided to start with ancient Greek. My ancient Greek teacher was a thoroughly convincing woman who thumped me on the head with my copy of Plato and convinced me, bullied me, coerced me, and now I love her for it, into studying early Christianity and um, in particular the historical Jesus. I decided at the end of college that I was going to go on in the study of classics and the study in particular of um, the Gospel of John in the context of um, Hellenistic and Roman moral philosophy. I really didn't have an, an idea at that point that I would return to this apocalyptic environment um, that was so familiar from, from the past. After college, I got into the University of Chicago. I really wanted to be in that program because they had committees that were designed to facilitate the comparative study of early Judaism and early Christianity with the Greco-Roman, uh, with Greco-Roman religion, with Greco-Roman economy and politics and so forth. So in my uh, doctoral program, New Testament and Early Christian Literature, we were given free reign to explore. Once I announced <clears throat> my intentions of uh, pursuing the study of the Gospel of John to my advisor, she said, well, if you're going to study John, you're not only going to need 
Greek philosophy, you've got to take a class on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Light and darkness, dualism, and all of these uh, ideas about the heavenly world and the earthly world are, um, are common both to John and to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I ventured into the unfamiliar world of the Dead Sea Scrolls at the University of Chicago and got quite happily stuck there. Never returned to the Gospel of John, although someday perhaps I might. The Dead Sea Scrolls were a revelation. It was, it was fascinating, on the one hand, to find something so familiar to my own ways of reading scripture as a child. On the other hand, it was quite striking to me how thoroughly certain, certain themes, certain literary forms within the Dead Sea Scrolls matched those of Greek and Roman literature, especially the literature that focused on ethics and political philosophy. At the same time that I was studying the Dead Sea Scrolls for the first time, I was in a seminar on human rights and natural law with Professor uh, Elizabeth Asmus, who does Hellenistic philosophy. We read a great deal of constitutional texts, Plato's Republic and Laws, Cicero's Republic and Laws, Xenophon's uh, Constitution of the Athenians, and the uh, Politeia of the Lacedaemonians, many texts uh, like this, Justinian, Justinian's Digest, and so forth. I noticed in the, in the literature that, that we read from the Greek philosophers, themes about how the cosmos was perfectly structured by divine will, and how that perfect structure ought to be the focus of human investigation. Because understanding that perfect structure of the world revealed the hand of the divine, ordering the universe perfectly, and confirmed a divine will or a divine impulse toward creating a particular form of social order. The ideal constitutional texts of the Greek and Roman philosophers consistently link an understanding of the divine, an understanding of the natural order, divinely created, anthropology, also divinely created, justice, human thriving, and so forth, as essential to understanding how properly to organize a city. It seemed to me when I looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls that we were reading that many of these themes were also argued by these sectarians. They were interested very much in how to understand how the natural order worked, how the sun rose and set throughout the year, marching um, across the horizon, one solstice to an equinox and to another solstice and then back again across the horizon. These patterns revealed, the sectarians claimed, the perfect will and divine order behind the structures of the universe. Interpreting these structures allowed the sectarians to support their claim that they also understood structures of history as revealed in scripture. I'd like to compare their interpretation of the Bible as something very similar to their interpretation of the universe. Just as surely as they were able to predict where the sun would rise and set one day after another, so also they were able to predict what scripture would reveal next. Not only did they interpret natural cycles and scripture with the supreme confidence that they've tapped into this divine key to unlocking these divinely structured um, worlds, they also looked back through history and claimed to be able to discern how human events unfolded according to a plan set in place from the foundation of the world. Everything was predetermined in human history, just as surely as the cycles of the celestial bodies, especially that sun, were predetermined 
by, by the work of God in creating the universe. This conviction, again, that the study, the understanding of the natural cycles led to a proper understanding of the divine. And that proper understanding of, of the divine led to ability to structure human society properly. It was a conviction that was shared in common between the Covenanter sect and these Greco-Roman groups. And I wanted to learn whether this resulted by coincidence or whether perhaps, as I suspected, the Covenanters were participating in some kind of common discourse about the divine and nature and anthropology and society that was very, very common among um, aristocratic, highly educated elites from Judea to the ends of the world. It's appropriate, I think, to explain very briefly what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. Many people have heard about them and about all of the scandals that have erupted around their publication or their lack thereof. But the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls is a bit more boring than the sensationalist uh, stories would, would suggest. The Dead Sea Scrolls were probably the library of this sect, which I'm calling the Covenanters in my book um, and in other scholarship uh, as well, this term appears. The term Covenanters, which I'm using for the sect, comes from their own self-description. They call themselves throughout the scroll, Ba'e Haberit, those who enter the covenant. Outsiders who looked at this sect and were contemporaries with it, Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, who was himself a native of Judea and an aristocrat, and um, the elder Pliny, a sort of encyclopedist who traversed both personally and through literature uh, the known Roman world, talk about this curious group of Essenes. The Essenes and the Covenanters were probably the same group. There's enough there are enough similarities between the two, um, between the descriptions of the outsiders and the description the self-description within the Dead Sea Scrolls to identify the groups with each other, although the identification is, is still con contested. So the Covenanters, probably the Essenes, are um, the subject of the book. The Dead Sea Scrolls seem to have been their library. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls constitute around 900 manuscripts, which were hidden in 11 caves around the shore of the Dead Sea, close to a settlement now um, known as uh, Kirbet Qumran. How the scrolls got into the caves has been a question that's vexed scholars for a long time, since their discovery. It seems, um, it seems likely that on the eve of the destruction of Jerusalem, probably around 70, um, members of the sect fled out into the Judean wilderness, carrying their most precious items with them. Their most precious items for a sect that oriented its activity around the study of sacred laws, cultic ritual, um, calendrical cycles, and above all, how to conduct cultic affairs in the temple in a way that kept the covenant with God, um, motivated the sectarians, of course, to pick up their precious sectarian, or the, their precious uh, text, their library. These fleeing sectarians seem to have come out into the Judean desert bearing manuscripts, manuscripts that were stashed, some quite hastily, into these 11 caves around the site of, um, of Qumran on the northwestern uh, shore of the Dead Sea. The library of the Dead Sea Scrolls, or perhaps a collection of libraries that belong to different cells of the Covenanter sect located throughout the towns of Judea, can be divided into 
three groups, roughly. There are many biblical scrolls which are invaluable for our study of the transmission of the Hebrew Bible. They're the earliest texts um, of the Bible and predate by many centuries the medieval manuscripts that, that provided the, um, uh, the basis for the modern biblical um, text. Biblical texts were one category of which uh, there are many, many copies. There are also parabiblical texts, most of which have a theology that might probably be con considered um, apocalyptic, not necessarily sectarian, but aimed at reforming cultic and legal practices within Judea along lines that would have been quite, um, quite central to priestly concerns. So, so the Covenanters collected biblical scrolls, they collected theological scrolls like First Enoch, these, these parabiblical texts, and most importantly for my own research, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain texts that the sectarians themselves wrote. The sectarians wrote many different kinds of texts. Some are interpretations of biblical prophecy. The, uh, they're called pesharim, or interpretations. And like the last day's newsletter that was on our coffee table uh, growing up, these pesharim link specific figures in prophecy, events in prophecy, to events that occurred within the Covenanter's own time. The sectarian scrolls that, um, that fascinated me most were the rule scrolls. These are scrolls that were written for the purpose of regulating and organizing sectarian life. The Covenanters were, by any sociological definition, a sect. They split off from whatever mainstream Judaism might have existed at the time. Most importantly, they identify themselves as having split off from, uh, from other groups within Judea over issues that primarily concern the conduct of the temple cult. They didn't want Gentiles marrying Jews and then presuming to enter into the sacred space that only uh, Israelites ought to enter. They disagreed profoundly with the use of a, a lunar 354-day calendar for the scheduling of um, the sacrifices required in the Torah. They vehemently objected to the Hasmoneans' combination of the offices of high priest and king, ruler and king first, and then high priest and king later, and anticipated the arrival at at a point within their own time, presumably, of a Messiah of Aaron and a Messiah of Israel. That is a separate high priest and a separate king and a prophet who would come and restore Israel to righteous leadership. This book builds upon three major events or insights into Dead Sea Scrolls research that have occurred within probably about the last uh, 10 to 20 years. The earliest view of the Covenanter sect was that it was a, a celibate male community that mainly lived around Qumran. The reason that the, that the scrolls were stashed in the caves is that the sectarians' main locus of operation was around the Dead Sea. And so naturally, they stowed their precious things there. Nowadays, we we tend to think of those who lived at Qumran, if there were any sectarians who actually lived there, as in the minority. It's more common, at least is becoming more common um, in, in mainstream Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship, to view the sect as one spread throughout the towns of Judea. This obtains both for um, members of the sect that were, that were probably celibate and who took on cultic, uh, uh, cultic duties in order to procure atonement for, um, for the land and for the people. The other segment of the, um, of the Covenanters lived a more normal life. They married and they had children. They lived in contact with Gentiles and seemed 
more or less like their fellow non-sectarian Jews, save for the fact that they refused to participate in temple worship um, when it was plotted. It's <laughs> not the best word. They refused to participate in temple worship on those days that were determined by the, the cycles of the 354-day lunar year. The covenanters insisted on a 364-day solar or Sabbath year, which um, has the advantage of being perfectly divisible by seven and makes every single festival fall on exactly the same day of the week every single year and with the exception of Yom Kippur, never on a Sabbath. It's a beautiful, perfect system, and it proves God's divine and perfect activity in structuring the cosmos. Another early view of the sectarians that has been revised fairly um, extensively at this point, and I hope um, much more so with the publication of, of this study, is that um, in earliest scholarship, the Covenanters were analyzed and described as the least Hellenized of all of the sects of Judea. This was because the Covenanters wrote their rule scrolls, their interpretations of prophecy, and other texts in a Hebrew that seems deliberately to have been modeled on Biblical Hebrew. They refrained from borrowing any Greek or Latin loanwords, you find Greek and Latin loan words throughout rabbinic texts from the Mishnah, the Tosefta, the, um, the, the Talmuds. The Covenanters seemed intent on not affecting anything that smacked of Hellenism. I think that they purged their discourse of Hellenism quite effectively, so effectively, in fact, that most scholars were convinced that these Jews were not Hellenized. Studies since about 1961, not many, but a few studies appeared that challenged that perspective and began to explore ways in which the Covenanters may have been just as affected by Hellenistic and Roman culture as their contemporaries um, in Judea who didn't attempt to hide it. These studies were few and far between until about uh, 1986, when a, a very slim monograph was published on the relationship between the Covenanters sect and Greco-Roman voluntary associations. This became the topic, in fact, of the book that, um, that I've published. The voluntary associations with which uh, Moshe Weinfeld was concerned were groups like the pro professional guilds, um, Purple Dyers at Thyatira, Dionysiac as um, associations in Athens, um, cults devoted to uh, Sevek, a crocodile god in Egypt, and, and many other groups throughout the Greco-Roman world. From the initiation practices to the habit of collecting funds for communal use to the dedicated space, uh, the use of a dedicated space for communal activity, the authority of a single uh, leader within a small group over um, members' activity, um, and so on, were, were quite strikingly similar from the Greco-Roman groups to the Dead Sea Scrolls community. Now, Moshe Weinfeld's monograph in 1986 was really only about 86 pages, a very short study. He didn't say anything new, in fact, but instead brought into English and, um, and Hebrew studies that had been conducted earlier by Hans Bartke in 1961 and 1963. The Germans were the best at getting this kind of scholarship out, scholarship on um, possible points of contact and influence between um, Hellenistic Roman culture and the, um, the ideas and the structure and the regulation of the Dead Sea Scrolls sect. Only a very few studies of the Dead Sea Scrolls 
uh, sect within the context of broader Hellenistic culture than had appeared until um, I conducted this study. The insights of those scholars were quite important, and I, I learned a great deal from, from uh, Hans Bartke, Randolph Herman, and Moshe Weinfeld, and, and a few others who picked up this kind of rare and suspect topic. At this point, scholars are more convinced that, that the Dead Sea Scrolls sect was uh, interested in the political events of their time, conversant in the economic norms um, of Hellenistic and Roman culture, and also concerned about um, the kinds of things that went on in politics, not only in Judea, but also in Rome. They knew how the Senate worked. They knew how the, um, the system of governance in Judea worked. And, and show um, striking familiarity with these the sort of conventions of Hellenistic Roman um, political organization and, and speech. In my book, I, I focus in particular on the ways in which these different voluntary associations, the Greco-Roman groups on the one hand and the Dead Sea Scrolls Covenanters on the other, how they related to the cities and the broader um, imperial authorities um, with, under whose uh, governance they operated. Civic Ideology, Organization, and Law in the Rural Scrolls is a book that focuses on the sim not only the similarities between the organization and the internal rules for the voluntary associations of the Greco-Roman society and the Covenanters, but on the, the ideology behind their formation um, and the way in which their, their concept of themselves as subjects of the state um, and participants in various you know, aspects of political life affected the, um, uh, the organization and regulation of the sect. While this book revisits a topic that's been studied by a few scholars um, over the last uh, 60 years or so, it offers the most um, systematic and sustained um, anal comparative analysis of the Greco-Roman Voluntary Associations and the Covenanters sect. Now, I attempted to, to understand the, um, the arguments for why these groups looked so similar in their organization, their methods of initiation, their punishments, their rules on how members ought to behave in public, and, and also uh, what to do if a member got in a fight with another member. How did these uh, similar rules from one group to another, um, how did these similarities come to be? The, and the explanation that I found throughout the scholarship was that the Covenanters had been influenced by Greco-Roman associational life. I really didn't understand what this process of influence meant, and nobody took the trouble to explain exactly how influence worked. In a couple of short and rather elusive and unsatisfying passages in the literature, I found claims that the Covenanters borrowed directly from the Greco-Roman voluntary associations. And here we're asked to assume that this apocalyptic Jewish sect, whose members were elites, interested in the, the politics and the governance of Judea, who were able to name officers of the Roman armies, that these groups borrowed from Dionysiac societies, um, you know, Egyptian cultic groups, or perhaps military associations that might have existed in Judea, but for which there isn't evidence. I suspected that there was probably a better way to explain the, 
presence of, of the similarities between the Greco-Roman voluntary associations and the Covenanters sect. One of the impediments to my accepting this model of influence is that the evidence for the Greco-Roman voluntary associations is linguistically, geographically, and temporally far removed from the Covenanters' environment. The associations are in Athens, in far um, uh, sort of the uh, territory of Byzantium, in Ptolemaic Egypt, in Rome. Some are in Asia Minor, but the evidence we have for those associations doesn't contain any rules for the most part. It's just inscriptions that an association existed here. I found it kind of hard to believe that associations that wrote their bylaws in Demotic in the third century BCE exerted some kind of influence from Egypt to a group that lived in Judea from about 100 BCE up to 70 CE, conducted most of its reading and conversation probably in Aramaic, wrote most of its texts in Hebrew. Um, this seemed implausible, and the same went for the, the Greek-speaking Dionysiac societies in Athens, the Roman-speaking um, society of uh, um, Diana and Antinous um, at, Lanu at Lanuvium. Um, so how did these associations come to resemble each other in, in so many different ways? Rather than assuming the direct contact and influence of associations upon the Covenanters, I thought perhaps these, all of these groups drew inspiration for their internal um, organization and self-regulation from a common source. Perhaps there was something in Egypt and in Athens and in Lanuvium that also existed in Judea. As I read, I found a source that seemed like a pretty plausible explanation, and that was the organization of the city. Jerusalem had been organized as a polis since the second century at least, while its initial organization in, into a Greco-Roman polis was um, uh, sort of done by people whose viewpoints were rejected um, later, the Maccabees, who overthrew the, um, the Seleucids and kicked out the, um, these Hellenizing Jews, retained the structures of Jerusalem as a polis. Partly out of convenience, um, it was much easier to deal with other states when your politics looked like the politics of the states with whom you had to deal. So identifying a, a common structure of the polis from Egypt to Athens to um, a large extent Rome, Asia Minor, and then Judea helped to um, identify this reasonable common source from which these associations drew their organization and their structure. This insight has extensive um, confirmation in modern studies of voluntary associations. I read a great deal of sociology and uh, political philosophy on, on modern associations and found a consistent feature of associational life. Associations draw their internal organization and laws from the organization and laws of the state. This is evident in things like how a bowling league identifies its leader. It tends to be a president. A synagogue also has a president as leader. The Hells Angels have a president in the United States. I think it might be a prime minister in England. It would be very good for this model if they did. Clearly, we can't attribute the common presence of presidents in the Hells Angels and the Elks Club and a bowling league and a synagogue to the influence of the Hells Angels upon the synagogue or any of those configurations. It's obvious that these groups draw their, um, their names and their structure of authority from the very familiar patterns of the state. 
This is, in fact, what seems to have happened in antiquity. Scholars of ancient voluntary associations in the Greco-Roman context um, have studied this fairly extensively. And it's a commonplace that ancient voluntary associations were organized like miniature cities. Now, having identified a common source that, that seemed more convincing, um, an explanation for these shared features than the idea that one association influenced another, um, I found that I hadn't actually discovered anything remarkable. This phenomenon of borrowing state patterns has been explored quite extensively in the, um, classical scholarship on Greek and Roman voluntary associations since Momsen's study in, in the 19th century um, on up into uh, scholars who are publishing today. So I think that it's a, it was a contribution to offer an insight from classics into the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it only managed to connect disciplines and make them bring them into conversation with each other. It didn't offer a particularly new insight. What struck me most was that a group like the Covenanters, which wished and planned for and in some ways sort of plotted the demise of the Judean state and the Roman Empire, managed to last for so long. Wouldn't the state want to quash an association like that? Are they unique among associations for this anti-state ideology? It struck me that associations not only draw, not only formulate their structure and their laws um, in response to, to state, um, to encounters with the state, but that their response, um, their self-definition, their organization and regulation are probably part of a larger ideological response to the state claims about authority. I began to study associations internal discourse from their, um, their beliefs to especially their organization and regulation as, as elements of their attempt to articulate something like um, a civic ideology. Now, by civic ideology, I, um, I mean a concept of members as subjects to a particular authority who belong to a state defined in various ways um, who have obligations that extend to fellow citizens of that state and then also to people who lie outside of that state. So civic ideology begins as an argument for legitimation from the perspective of the state. A state is an authority and it presents a series of, of arguments that justify and legitimate its uh, possession of that authority. Civic ideology begins as an, uh, an argument for the legitimacy of state authority. It comes from the state itself and attempts to found the state's possession of um, you know, the governance and military authority and police authority and ability to make laws on certain categories that, the, that subjects tend to accept as um, authentic sources of um, authority. Theology is one very common way in which a state will articulate its civic ideology. The gods have willed that it be so. Another related argument comes from nature. The way that we observe nature shows that this particular structure of the city brings human life into conformity with the order established by the gods and visible in nature. Or, as we can see in Aristotle's politics and, and Plato's Republic, um, human anthropology, the structure of the soul, the relationship between men and women and children and slaves and others requires that we structure our city in this way. So states initiate, as, as, um, as I argue in the book, a civic ideology to which subjects respond. Most associations articulate something like an assimilative civic ideology, which means that, for the most part, they absorb 
and accept the state's definition of them as subjects accountable to the state's authority. Their rearticulation of state civic ideology as assimilated by the association confirms the state's claims to authority. Most associations in antiquity articulate an assimilative civic ideology. Most associations attempt to locate themselves within the state's structures, from its bureaucracy and um, various branches to the laws that, are, that hold its values in order to gain some advantage within the society. At the same time that we find most associations articulating this assimilative civic ideology, we find a few, the Covenanters among them, but not the only ones, who articulate what I've called an, um, an alternative civic ideology. In an, an alternative civic ideology, an association defines members as citizens of a commonwealth that's alternative to and superior to um, that of the state. For the Covenanters, they, um, this, this alternative polity is Israel as God intended it to be. Members, Jewish um, citizens of Judea were, you know, um, B'nai Havel, sons of deceit um, or uh, sons of darkness. They weren't truly they were apostate members of Israel, and, and, and they would inherit the judgment that, befell, that befalls apostates in, um, in many biblical texts. The Covenanters identify themselves as members of this idealized, eschatological Israel that will be established at the end of days by God. Um, and in so doing, do something that we find other voluntary associations from around the same time um, doing as well. The Cynics, uh, a school of philosophy that goes back to, to Athens, um, describe, its, uh, describe members of its society as um, citizens of the world, citizens of a true polis, the, the polis of the cosmos that transcends all uh, particular and insignificant uh, and trifling distinctions that exist between human beings. Epicureans resisted state civic ideology by calling members not citizens of another polis, but um, friends among a household. The household was the cosmos, and citizens were united by a common devotion to friendship. Stoics articulated another civic ideology that's very similar to, uh, to Cynics. In Paul, uh, in, in Paul's letters, he seems to articulate um, an eschatological civic, alternative civic ideology with some things in common with the Covenanters. Citizens of his alternative polis belong to um, the, um, the Jerusalem above, or that, you know, the, uh, a heavenly polis. Um, they're a, a polytuma, a, citizens, a citizenry that has its proper um, territory in the heavenly realm. That's where their true identity comes from. So from Cynics to the Epicureans to the Stoics to Paul's churches, we find groups that articulated an alternative civic ideology that peacefully existed within the, um, the territories and cities governed by the Roman Empire um, and, and managed to last for very, very long periods of time, over hundreds of years in some cases. So having an alternative civic ideology did not mean, uh, did not itself constitute a death sentence for an association. It was only in those cases that associations acted in revolutionary ways and attempted to overthrow um, authorities that they, were, that they were put down. A major contribution of this book, besides its identification of civic ideology as a consistent um, 
element of the, the self-description of voluntary associations, from those who assimilated state ideology to these groups with alternative um, ideology. Um, uh, alongside this, this uh, thing, the book also uh, explores, in particular, the, the way in which the Covenanters' laws reflect their anticipation of assuming actual governance of a restored Judea at the end of days. They were not speculating idly, like Plato or like the Stoics, on a utopian sort of philosophical dream. They were actually planning, like really, really committed law students, to careers in restored Israel, when God intervened and reestablished this righteous polity at the end of days. They were ready to rule. And they studied laws, not only in order to govern themselves in the present, but in order to govern Israel when it was restored to its full um, divinely, uh, divinely legislated form. The, um, now, <clears throat> one of the most important things that I hope readers get from this book, and which I hope especially my students get from the classes that come out of, of this research, is that it is well worthwhile to revisit the scrolls that were first discovered. Many sort of cottage industries have sprung up in Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship, in which uh, scholars focus on very small or novel um, aspects of, the, um, of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls corpus. But the fundamental questions still deserve to be asked. To what extent did the Covenanters understand, assimilate, uh, reject, accept Hellenistic and Roman culture? To what extent were the Covenanters um, known to their fellow Jews? How did these first scrolls that were developed, or how did these first scrolls that were discovered actually function in a practical way among the sect? These kinds of questions have been asked since the very uh, earliest days of Dead Sea Scrolls research. I think that they haven't yet been fully answered, and so it's well worthwhile to spend time plumbing the most basic um, topics in, in the scrolls and revisiting these fundamental texts uh, that first came to light um, among, among the scrolls. Now, while this tome is hefty, it's not comprehensive. The laws of the Covenanters deserve to be investigated much, much, much more. While I, I treat the most important laws for the regulation and the organization of the sect, I certainly don't go um, into, every, into the details of every one. So the laws are important to, the, the laws deserve much more study. More importantly, I think what I lay a foundation for in the book is um, a study of the, the way in which a sort of apocalyptic ideology functioned in relationship to the laws. I explore certain elements of their expectation of God's intervention and judgment at the end of days, but I leave aside certain things that are, um, th that recur quite regularly within the scrolls. The most important of which is a sort of mysticism. Members of the sect engaged in liturgical practice that brought them into the presence of angels. They were able to sing alongside angelic hosts and praise God in ways that were on earth, in ways that were consistent with what was going on in heaven. This, by the way, is something that my mother also did in prayers um, in church at home and at home. So how, how did mystical practice relate to this sort of law school among the covenanters? They, they were equally devoted to communion with divine beings, and rigorous study of the law. The last thing that I would like to see uh, developed in greater detail, and which I'm working on myself um, and assign to my students, those bold enough to take up this challenge, 
is um, how exactly did the Covenanters' civic ideology relate to the civic ideology of the Hasmoneans? Throughout the book, I hypothesized that the Covenanters' civic ideology developed as a response to the claims of the Hasmonean rulers. I don't, however, spend much time at all developing um, a reconstruction of Hasmonean civic ideology. This can be done in a couple of ways, one of which is to read Hasmonean propaganda in First Maccabees and some snippets that are collected in Josephus. But I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls might offer something like a mirror image of Hasmonean arguments for legitimacy, where the Hasmoneans point to their piety as proof of their, um, their legitimacy. The Dead Sea Scrolls sect says, you are not pious, you, don't, you do not belong to the covenant, you reject God's covenant, in fact. In, in many other ways, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls sect seems to be responding directly to claims that the Hasmoneans made for their legitimacy.